thank you, Maha, for beginning the recording again. And so, yeah, I'd like to invite Eli to share share screen. And our second talk is going to be looking at from pandemic to endemicity. Uh, is behavior over or underweighted in modeling the COVID-19 pandemic? And so Eli is joining us from John Hopkins School of Medicine and Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy. So thank you very much and please do take it away when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Ed, can, can you see my screen? Uh, we can see your screen and we can hear you, hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you. great. Um, so thank you, Michael. That was, that was a really interesting talk and, and a, a great uh, warm up for uh, I think this this will be a really exciting session. Um, I, I'm I'm going to confess that I, I I have spent more time I think in, in what Michael was talking about, looking backwards uh, a little bit more than uh, looking forwards in terms of uh, new work in terms of what this talk is uh, looking at. Um, in part because um, I've spent the last two years looking forward, um, building models that that have uh, been used for uh, developing um, and, and predicting uh, uh, where the pandemic is going to go. And so, uh, well, there's still uh, this question of what is the end game. And I think that is sort of uh, what Andrew was talking about and what we're all talking about uh, going forward. Um, I'm going to start by actually going a little bit backwards and, and talking about modeling of the infectious diseases and and what the different types of functions matter, right? So this, the classical transmission model um, is, is an SEIR type model where, uh, you know, you produce these nice SEIR type curves where uh, you have this sort of simple math for an SEIR type model where beta, which is the transmission rate, assumes that the mixing rate of transmission uh, that transmission is a function of mixing between susceptible and infected individuals. And in this case, beta encompasses both the transmission probability and the contact rates. And um, you know, then from that, you can generate those very simple statistics like the basic reproductive number, which is just a function of beta over gamma. So the rate of recovery, uh, over, uh, I mean, the rate of transmission over the rate of recovery. And thus you have this very simple function where as R naught goes above one, the, you get spread. And if it goes below one, you don't get spread. Um, but th there's a couple of really interesting things to think about there is that because it's a function of two things, it's both beta and gamma, you can get similar uh, R naughts or the same R naught, but different curves depending on uh, your on how beta and gamma are related. Um, similarly, um, you know, one of the other things is that if you get the effective reproductive number, which is based on um, uh, the number of susceptibles, right? So our effect, our basic reproductive number assumes everyone is susceptible. As the pool of susceptibles falls, that R not will, will fall, or the effective reproductive number will fall. And then when that goes below one, well, that's the peak of your curve. So that's sort of the basics of how we think generally think about many of the um, classical type of ordinary differential equation models that underlie a lot of the models that have been used in. Uh, pandemic planning, um, and then they get more complicated from there. But the but you know the the key point that I think we want to talk about today is this question, or that I want to talk about today is this question of prevalence dependent behavior. Um, and so in that case, what we do is we add a function, right? So now beta is a function of the infection rate. Now this could be more complicated. It could be different types of functions. It can be extended to the number of hospitalizations, deaths, or some composite functions. But in essence, it's a function that changes the transmission rate due to the number of infections. And the assumption around that is that people change their behavior. So you have people changing their behavior as infection numbers rise, um, and then um, and that leads to to a flattening of the curve in, in it, right? And and there are other ways to do this. You could have different betas for different groups, um, but it's still assuming that as pe as uh, Although in this case, it wouldn't change um, as the cases rise. So it's not as different unless you assume that people move into different groups over time. Um, at the extreme, right, as you as you disaggregate groups, you can actually go to an individual based model. Um, and that's what, what um, we've been running here for the last couple of years, um, in which individuals have different contact patterns and, and thus they can have different responses to infection. 
uh, rates as well as the role of contact networks, right? And so um, closing schools and, and the impact of that on, on child behavior can, can be modeled directly within those models. Um, and so all of those different types of things can be uh, implemented. Of course, it adds uh, measures of me uh, stochasticity that make it difficult to always uh, determine what are the uh, what are the outcomes that are most important and how do these different variables mix together? Um, so if we go back and we look at the, whether there's been prevalence dependent behavior, the, the obviously the question is, what do we use for modeling or understanding behavior over time? Um, and so I, I remember clearly it was back in somewhere in the early 2010s when someone presented a, 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 some work they'd been doing where they were uh, modeling, or they were actually letting people use an app on their phones that tracked where they went, um, and then showing how people moved around in space. And, and I remember talking with people and saying, wow, if we had that data on a large scale, we could really predict how flu was spreading through the population. So we actually now have that data, and this is just one version, right? So this is Apple's version. There's lots of people have used the safe graph data um, and, and other types of uh, mobile phone data to look at how people are moving about. Um, and what we saw was a dramatic decline in, in movement data early in the pandemic. Um, and th this though was not as consistent with the actual case numbers, right? Um, though if we look at hospitalizations and we look at deaths, perhaps there is, there is more of a relationship, right? But in general, the biggest decline in, in mobility occurred early on. And while there were declines in mobility later on, they tended to be less and less as the pandemic went on. So uh, the mobility data just alone from cell phones wasn't giving us completely what uh, was likely to be the relationship, although there does seem to be a relationship between um, cases, cases rising or hospitalizations rising and changes in behavior. Um, however, when we went and did this at sort of a bigger scale, you look at initial mobility data um, and the relationship to case data, the lockdowns when they expired in May um, showed no real correlation in, in early May, the changing behavior uh, roles and, and spread of cases at that point. Um, so that was sort of disappointing because the initial data from the mobility from the phone data suggested there was a really strong relationship. So, uh, of course, you know, the United States is actually quite large, made up of several different regions with different climat climatic uh, differences and different cultural differences. So we, we took that and split it up into, I, I guess, every county in the US um, and looked at the mobility data within those counties as well as the humidity data. Um, and in, those, in that situation now, we've, we do tend to see some relationships. And, and the key point here is that the mobility data is telling us lots of different things, right? So people, are moving around, um, uh, both walking, transit, parks, retail. Um, and in, in any of those situations, what it isn't telling us, um, and, and what we found is when you put all of that together, you do see these uh, some of these relationships really start to come out strong. And then obviously that graph is really hard to see, but you can see that um, there was certainly a relationship to workplace movement. So as people started to go back to work, um, we definitely see a relationship to cases. There's also a relationship to humidity, um, which is what we believe is what drives some of that seasonality that typically that we see. And of course, this was all different based on the different timings of the uh, of the pandemic. So that early part of the pandemic seems to have been very different than sort of later parts of the pandemic. And in part, what we don't get from the cell phone data, um, which is just telling us about how people are moving, is what people are doing when they get to those places. So if everyone is moving about and interacting, but everyone's wearing masks, that's a different situation than if people are just moving about in a normal time frame, uh, the way they were prior to the pandemic. Um, so while, rather than just looking at cases, hospitalizations, or death, another factor that we've looked at is the fear of disease. Um, this is somewhat hard to measure, but you know, YouGov has done some studies on this, and you can see that there was this rapid increase initially in the fear um, that uh, and, and how people were avoiding crowded places and the fear of catching it went up pretty dramatically early in the pandemic, and then came down a little bit and then stayed constant for a long time and through 2020. And then you see this decline in, in that as vaccines became available. Now, of course, these are sort of this is averaged across the US. 
Um, and so having measures of this at a local uh, level is not uh, as tenable and, and has not been done, but clearly there are other factors besides just movement that matter. Um, so while cases and deaths and hospitalizations may have driven fear in some proportion of the population, um, which resulted in a modification of their behavior, other cultural factors abrogated those pressures across geographical scales. And so obviously belief in science, trust in government has have those things have been shown to dramatically uh, impact mask use. Um, it changed the rate at which people uh, uh, have uptake of vaccination. And, and you know, while, while I'm, I'm not making this political in any way, the those areas of uh, where people have sort of said like, oh, Trump County, Biden County, there, there is, while, while there do, do tend to be these massive differences, they are not monolithic in, in beliefs within those populations, right? So when you really start to get down into those populations, there is still, there are some people who are uh, more fearful and, and staying home and wearing masks than some people who are not. And that, that, that scale slides across from, from area to area. And that has implications on how, how transmission occurs. So getting back to prevalence dependent behavior, um, one of the things that we that is we typically talk about is how as the cases rise, people change their behavior. But the more in some ways and the more important part as we sort of move towards the end game is that as cases fall, people also change their behavior and start to go back out again. Right. And uh, and so we see that right as as cases started to fall at the end of February or February last year, you see um, uh, movement starts to go back up. Um, and, then, and then in July of last year, 2021, um, you know, when we, we were sort of announced that the pandemic was over, everybody sort of started going out and partying um, again. And, and in fact, what you see is, is a couple interesting things. Um, first is that while there was some sort of baseline level that we were using for our mobility trends, all the data went above that baseline. So it's unclear what exactly is a baseline um, for all of this data. Where where is sort of normal versus uh, not normal? Where's the normal scale? And the second thing is that it's very difficult to disentangle um, the relationship between behavior and the introduction of these new variants, right? So the alpha variant, which was introduced sometime in the U.S. in December, um, started to spread not until behavior really started to change in, in February. Um, and then the, off, the Delta variant was actually introduced. Uh, I think the first cases in the US were in May, maybe even April. Um, and yet you don't have a massive increase in Delta until behavior changes. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to understand how to, to model those things and predict the future when, uh, when, when, where those two things are intersecting. And the whole reason for doing all these mathematical models and trying to understand the spread that includes prevalence dependent behavior is to try to improve our projections for future cases. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the big question, though, is, is, is at some level, how, how does this prevalence dependent behavior affect uh, those projections, right? And, and at what time scale, right? And so this is the data from the COVID uh, modeling hub, I think is what for the forecast hub. Um, and there was a scenario modeling hub, which tried to show that these aggregated models tended to be better. And, and while they did, they also tended to be very poor in general at catching these uh, big upswings and then also the big downswings. So what is the utility of those and, and, and what scale? And the other thing is that many of these models use sort of the SIR type model where um, it's basically like a chemical, chemical equation. We're looking at the averages of how all these people interact. And it doesn't take account of maybe some of these extremes that might matter, particularly when things are low or when things are very high. But I think the, most, the big important questions, which I think uh, Andrew and Michael started to raise, is, is what is the time horizon for projections to be useful? So what, what I've been doing over the last couple of years is, is building these models. And, and primarily, I've been interfacing with uh, the hospital uh, the hospital leadership and the state level. And the hospital leadership is particularly interested in, in a shorter time window on some levels because they need to know when are we go or do we need to open up a new ICU next week? Um, and uh, well, at the same time, they're also interested in what is going to be the impact of COVID on our business operations for the next year. So those two things are, are, are difficult to sort of 
put together in a single model and understand a, a scale that's useful for the hospital. Um, and, and those policy level decisions are, are made at that, at that scale. And what's the geographic scale that's useful, right? So I think it's helpful and instructive to think about how uh, weather, which has been uh, obviously uh, forecast for, for many, many years and, and weather forecasts have improved dramatically. Um, but in general, those weather forecasts are very accurate uh, at a t are, are accurate at a scale of about a week to two weeks. Two weeks out, um, the weather forecasts don't tend to be very good, um, and you can use sort of general averages. So the question then is, you know, uh, what 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 type of modeling are we going to do that is going to be useful at a time scale and a horizon and going to be effective? The other important thing is, is, as Michael brought up earlier, was, you know, what the weather is, and this is the weather in Cambridge, um, what the weather is in Cambridge, whether or not to wear a jacket, has no, or bring an umbrella, has no impact on me at all. Whereas, uh, you know, what, what the COVID numbers are in, in England might have some bearing at some point in the future on, on, on me. So those, those types of things, are, I, I think, are, are uh, necessary to understand it and to think about where we need to go with models at, at a scale that is useful for uh, for people, uh, for, for policymakers, and at what types of models are useful for policymakers um, and, and who needs to make them. And finally, you know, well, the question, I guess, is when will the pandemic end? Um, and, and this gets to sort of this question of behavior, right? So the WHO declared the pandemic on March 11th. But it's really like that wasn't that's really just a symbolic gesture at that point. What, what matters was actually the public health emergency of international concern that was declared in January 2020, which actually has some legal binding. Um, but uh, already by March 11th, I think March 12th, basically Maryland shut down and most of America already shut down. So the declaration of the pandemic was already sort of late in that timing. Um, and while there while there will be a technical end to the to the PHIC, there are areas, uh, and I was in one this past week in Florida, where the pandemic is, for all intents and purposes, over, um, and people are, are people acting like it's over at least. Well, in other places, people remain in a state of anxiety and fear, and this might last for years. But the the question, sort of going forward, is what risk level is acceptable to the majority of individuals, at which that return to normalcy will occur, um, and it's going to happen, right? And it's just a question of what is the going to be the impact of that on the case numbers going forward? Because understanding what, what those factors, so, so, so for me going backwards and understanding how, the, how factors like fear and, and mobility drove uh, the pandemic in certain areas can help us in determining how the current pandemic will play out as, as new variants might emerge, as people sort of return to normal and what types of policies can mitigate future pandemics. Um, in general, uh, you know, people have, have come up with all these different models that were theoretical in terms of how people might behave um, in, in the event of, of a pandemic. And now we actually have had one and have unprecedented data. And it's probably time to sort of start going back and evaluating how those different types of behavioral questions and the prevalence kind of behavior actually perform and, and how that's likely to have an impact going forward. And I'll Brilliant. Thank, thank you.